Okie dokie, this is about to be a very spicy take for a conservative. As you all know, conservatives love working. In fact, we are the party of jobs. We're the party of work. We are the party of pull yourself up by your gosh darn bootstraps, you lazy hippie communist, and get to the coal mines if you want to eat. I consider myself a conservative, even if others don't, and I fully reject this approach, certainly in this modern economy. And I'm tired of seeing conservatives ceding so much ground to the left when it comes to social perception of which party stands with and understands the average worker, because right now it feels like no one does. But before we get into all of this, I wanted to give a massive thank you to today's sponsor, Private Internet Access VPN. Today, a VPN is beyond necessary for your web browsing, with big tech, government, and hackers all wanting your information, Private Internet Access VPN will ensure your browsing data, location, and personal info is kept private. PIA has 50 servers in 50 states. Need to look like you're surfing the web from Oklahoma? They've got an IP for that. Need to visit a website that can only be accessed within Alaska? They've got an IP for that too. With IP addresses in all 50 states, you can avoid sporting event blackouts if your local network opts out of televising the game. You can access news stations, online banking and streaming services outside your state borders, watch TV shows before they're premiered in your time zone, prevent hackers from seeing your keystrokes, passwords and work files, and you certainly want to have your VPN on when you're accessing your pension, 401k, IRA, or any online banking to prevent data exposure. Better yet, with my special link below in the description, you can get 82% off with a 30-day money-back guarantee if you sign up for private internet access today. Just check out that link down below in the description. Welcome back. All right. Tradition is what makes a conservative a conservative. The left, the liberals, they demand to change society to fit their own ends by whatever means necessary. Even radical free market capitalists are really not conservative by this metric, which begs the question, as conservatives, what traditions are we supposed to preserve? Many of my fellow conservatives look back to the 50s as their shining example of what life and civilization ought to look like. And to be sure, there are things to love there, things we wish we could have preserved. But the 50s did not exist in a vacuum. And even in those times conservatives look at with longing, we were starting to slip down the batshit insane slide to clown world that we are on today. So sure, you know, turn back the clock to the 50s, but you'll only enjoy it for about 10 years until we enter the 60s, 70s, 80s, and eventually repeat the whole damn cycle until dogs are getting monkeypox and children are transgender. And it's worthwhile looking at the hints we could have seen that led us in this direction. The trickle of social change that started in the 20th century became a flood after the Second World War. What used to be a community, larger families and wider society working together to raise children as a unit, ended up a little more rigid with the nuclear family. To be sure, the family unit is a good thing, but women being stuck at home with materialism on the rise, focus on appearance, hair curlers, and Valium, it wasn't exactly ideal. The left liked to make it sound like every housewife in this era was a miserable slave, and I don't believe that for a second. But it is true that many women were becoming struck with feelings of isolation in suburbia, with benzodiazepine addiction becoming far more common, especially among housewives. Even the Rolling Stones wrote about it in some of their songs, Mommy's Little Helper, pointing to the fact that even in the 50s, that slow drift away from larger communities, living amongst extended family, etc., to focus on smaller and smaller circles, which eventually just became the individual, did begin to have its consequences to some degree. And I'm not suggesting this is any fault of conservative ideology, it just sort of happened naturally. And even more so today that being less involved with extended family, grandparents, etc., moving away for work or cheaper housing, and only prioritizing your immediate family, this all just became more normalized over time. Now, despite this nitpick, the 50s were still pretty damn good. The middle class absolutely thrived in the middle of the 20th century, earnings soared, housing was cheap, and opportunities were ripe for the taking of any capable man. But under the surface, for men as well, hints of a societal trouble were brewing. How did a man provide for his family? By leaving the home for the day and working. Let's wind back the clock a little further. 
At the start of the century, people began getting excited about this new concept that was coined the Protestant work ethic. In order to be moral, in order to be an upstanding citizen, you had to work hard and earn your keep in society. And apparently some people took this really damn seriously, or at least their employers did, because people were working like 10 to 12 hour workdays at a time in the early 1900s, until 1938 when Roosevelt passed a law implementing the 40 hour work week as an absolute absolute maximum for businesses, otherwise they had to pay overtime. Of course, in classic fashion, people pushed things straight to the legal limit and made sure to create the 9 to 5 work week in which companies could take full advantage of that 40 hours before they'd be forced to pay people more. So the standard became one must now instead work for an 8 hour day every day except for time off at the weekend. And that's how you would demonstrate your worth as a functioning human being. For eight hours, under the Protestant work ethic attitude, the more productive you are at the office, the greater a person you are. Go capitalism. And you know what? It worked, at least for a while. When America really took charge on the world stage, the average full-time employed man could very easily buy a house, support his family, and enjoy life without much worry about what he had in the bank. So even if you dreaded what you were doing from 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, at the very least, you felt rewarded for all your hard work. And you know, hell, it wasn't as long as your grandparents had to work, right? As time has gone on, this has changed drastically though. However, the attitude of many establishment conservatives towards the economic system seems to have not changed with that. While leftists will put forward their complaints about work culture in often immature and hyperbolic ways, it can sometimes feel like anyone who dares question, you know, slaving away in a soulless corporate environment is branded a communist by some figures on the right. Because how is society supposed to function without the coffee, the meetings, and the executives in Cuba right? The Zoomers, on the other hand, have reacted not so well to their parents' and grandparents' views on work, and they have become completely disenfranchised with working, so angry and so bitter towards societal expectations to get a job, so utterly uninterested in joining the system, that many of them barely last a few weeks at a new job and seem to have no respect for showing up on time or doing general duties at all. And for those who do stay at work, the new trend is quiet quitting, refusing to put any more than the bare minimum of effort into work possible. And while normally I would relentlessly mock this sort of lazy progressive thought and action or lack thereof, the more I observe and listen to young people in the workforce, the more I understand their apathy. And I think conservatives are missing out on a big opportunity here to show that they understand these people and have better solutions to the societal crisis they're facing than reviving old failed ideologies that killed millions. It's not good enough to just tell younger generations, you have to work or you'll die. This isn't a utopia, bucko. That much is obvious. What people want to hear is, you need to work, but work doesn't need to look like this. And what do I mean by this? What happened to our economy and work culture since the great boom in the 1950s? One, the nine to five can no longer support a family. Even on an average or above average wage, median annual household income is below living wage. Two, the nine to five no longer has anything to do with your community. You used to spend eight hours building up the people around you, improving the business of your neighbor, interacting with the people you love and making their lives better, and working with your friends and people who live in your area. This is no longer the case. Most people work for multinational corporations whose owners they will never even know the name of and whose coworkers they'll often never even meet. Of course, this isn't the case for every individual, but it is becoming more and more common as small businesses are completely wiped off the map by bad government policy. Three, the nine to five used to have some purpose. For many, it no longer does. Far too many people are working what I like to call bullshit jobs that serve absolutely no purpose other than to have somebody employed. It's been a common trope for years now that many people have no idea what their job even entails. Wow, busy schedule. What do you do? Then home again for two days, then back to bloody New York again. What do you do for a living? You must know what job you do. No, I have literally no idea. 
I travel all over the place and have meetings with other men who look very like me, and we josh about golf handicaps and, you know, the wives' breasts, but I really don't know why. See that? Christ alone knows what that's all about. At 17, my local government initiated a jobs creation campaign, which I was hired under, where I had to click the elevator buttons in an event center. There were only three floors and the elevator lights went off after five minutes of no use. So I basically just sat in the dark for hours to get paid. Thankfully, I didn't lose my mind or I did, depending who you ask. Four, outside of things like cashier positions, which require necessary manning for a period of time, the nine to five concept is not really based on merit of work or output of work, but having you bend your knee to whatever corporation or entity is employing you for a set period of time. I'll admit this is more common in government or government funded jobs, but those are like a quarter of jobs in many countries. I personally worked a student union job where I would finish my tasks in like two hours and have to sit around looking busy for the next six and observed literally all my coworkers doing the exact same thing. This incentive incentivizes unproductive behavior because why bother finishing your tasks early and getting ahead if you're just gonna get paid the exact same to bumble and dawdle about all day and finish by five. Next, the nine to five used to have upward mobility. It often no longer does. The only upward mobility is for those who hold degrees, not those who work well within a company. And anyone who has to work from nine to five to live often does not have the time to acquire the degrees necessary for upward mobility that someone in a more privileged position with trust funds, university payments from the bank of daddy and a free apartment can, even if they're not as well versed in said actual job. You used to hear about men working their way from the mail room of a corporation to CEO. That kind of stuff will never happen again. This means that people working on the lower end of nine to five jobs are now often managed by people who have absolutely no conception of what it is like to work the jobs they're managing, leading to a massive disconnect and bitterness between upper management and average workers. Six, the nine to five used to allow people to have savings. Now the average salary of a nine to five worker barely allows them to get by from paycheck to paycheck. Seven, the nine to five, or at least some of them, used to be fun. <laughs> a lot of jobs used to have at least a bit of freedom within them, right? People used to be able to make jokes. People used to get hired for their competency. Now with mass creation of HR departments, making a joke could mean the end of your job. Just being born damn white these days probably means your upward mobility in a company is completely shot. The creation of mass HR departments was the death of company camaraderie. I'm a recruiter. It's a small, small, small industry, smaller than you'd think. Same with HR. So if you're looking for a job or maybe trying to keep a job, maybe, just maybe, think about what you're putting on social media. Again, freedom fighters. I know you're not really big with stats and, you know, facts aren't your thing, you know, but what I can tell you, what is a fact? Is that recruiters talk and recruiters like the majority of Canada don't agree with you do you know what that means do you have any guesses any guesses what that means what that means is that if you need a job you might not get one if you want to keep a job you might not get to do that then what do we do we terminate you with cause if we're so lucky if not we give you the minimum allowed by law either way best of luck to you Recruiters are watching, HR is watching everywhere, and we hate you. We hate you so much. And you think we can't do anything, but we can. We have the power. Always remember that. My heart goes out to you guys. I mean, you have families to feed, right? You brought your kids to this big event. You're freedom fighters. You're standing up. Oh, they will be so, so proud. So, so, so proud of you. Fuck yourself. Next, our countries have mass produced people with degrees and made it so that your salary is tied to said degrees, which means high paying jobs are massively oversaturated, while the only available jobs in mass are low paying minimum wage jobs, with a large portion of the populace being 
way overqualified for them. The amount of Uber drivers with degrees and even masters that you'll meet is getting comical. Eight. Nine. Mass immigration has inflated housing prices and crushed wage growth, meaning you're no longer competing with just your neighbor for a job, but competing with the smartest applicant from overseas who can be potentially paid less and result in some sort of diversity quota discount for a company. 10. The only way to move up in a company or to be recognized or sometimes just stay aboard in general is to take your work home with you and essentially make it your entire life. It's become a bit of a joke online, but it's not really at all, that people will say, I didn't want to work a nine to five, so I decided to start working for myself. And now I work 24 seven. And the nine to five is not only defended, but the 24 seven work ethic is defended even more by conservatives. And as a result, these people have no time to spend with their families, no time to give to their communities. Even if they're clocking out right at five, most people's commutes home are a hellish nightmare with cities being overcrowded. They leave home at 7 a.m., they get home at six, and by that time they're exhausted and need sleep, they'd better not sleep in and show up five minutes late for work at their mega corporation or they'll be fired. Human beings are simply numbers on a check sheet to these mega corps. So, you know, God forbid you're a couple minutes late because you were ill, doesn't matter. You're written up and bye-bye. You weren't a human to us in the first place. You know, conservatives love to talk about community. They love to talk about family values. But who are the people that spend time with their family and community the most? It's boomers who are either retired or who have been grandfathered into well-paying job positions that allow them to have a life outside work. The only people in communities organizing craft fairs, barbecues, cooking associations, knitting clubs, etc. It's all boomers. The younger generation no longer have any time or capacity to get together and get to know their community, let alone be the ones setting these things up. Most of them don't even know how they're going to afford a home or pay off their loans. This sort of culture is completely soul-destroying and indefensible. Is government and democratic policies and inflation causing a lot of these problems? Yes, absolutely, they are. But it doesn't really matter who or what is causing the problems at this point because it doesn't change the fact that too many conservatives have seeded the image of caring about workers to the left. It's the Labour Party saying, let's have a four-day work week. It's the Guardian writing articles criticizing the 9 to 5. It's massive anti-capitalist reddit pages like anti-work uniting people in their frustrations with the current work world. Yes, their solutions are terrible and stupid, but there's a reason so many people are gravitating towards a group that they feel are finally talking about this. Conservatives have so many solutions they could be putting forward in this arena, but too many seem unwilling to admit that maybe, just maybe, Zoomers and other young generations' apathy towards work is not just because they're a bunch of lazy, spoiled, entitled progressive brats, but because work is not the same as it used to be at all. We're dealing with an entirely different beast, one that you used to wrestle with to buy a home and support your family, but now it just eats you and your will to live. You get rare exceptions, but the vast majority of normal people do not see anyone on the right talking about their crushing work conditions. Instead, you have pundits ranting and raving at millennials and Zoomers to just stop eating so much avocado toast and drinking coffee so they can pull themselves up by their bootstraps just like they did and buy a house. Yeah, I'm sure that extra $7.99 a month will get a mortgage on that now $4 million house in the neighborhood you grew up in. Oh, is that you conservatives saying that if millennials want a home, they should move to the middle of nowhere? This is a self-report, I have said this before. But the more I've thought about it, I don't think it's a very conservative suggestion to abandon your friends, elderly family and community you grew up in to be taken over by wealthy immigrants. Conservatives and certainly conservative politicians need to be going way harder on their opposition to mass foreign ownership. They need to be going way harder on limiting immigration to rates that don't exceed housing demand. They need to be going way harder on reducing restrictions on building instead of just telling people to move out of the cities because the cities are where some people's entire lives are. And no conservative should ever be responding to young working people jilted by the current environment by rejecting the struggle they are in right now and being dismissive. Every generation is forced to contend with older generations telling them that their problems just aren't as bad as theirs were and they really just need to suck it up. But the truth is, it's not really that one or the other problems are better or worse. They're just 
different problems. Yes, as millennials and Zoomers, we have iPhones, we have Amazon Prime, Netflix, and safer sanitized working environments, but conservatives more than anyone should know these things are not what brings purpose and happiness to one's life. Owning your own property, feeling appreciated at your work, being able to support your family, these are all things younger people desperately desire but do not experience. And perhaps the spiritual crisis of younger generations isn't as obvious on the surface level as the struggle of working in a coal mine 40 years ago may be, but it doesn't make the problem any less of a problem. If anything, a spiritual crisis should be more important than a physical one to the right. And beyond all this, there is one last horror I have to highlight that I don't think anyone in politics considers enough. Let's put on our tinfoil hats all together for a second. Why would so many government or subsidized jobs want you working for eight hours when you could finish them in two? Why are so many jobs in general comfortable with your pay packet holding so little value? Making 100K in many cities might as well be minimum wage these days. Rental and food prices are through the roof. People have massive amounts of debt after getting that new car, that mortgage, that four bedroom family home. Fun fact, it used to just be a normal recommendation with older generations to hold six months salary in their bank accounts just in case. This suggestion would be laughable for younger generations because today personal debt is skyrocketing. Household debt in America stood at almost 14 trillion in 2015, mostly driven by mortgages. Instead of paying off our house by working a few years, we have to pass it on to our children. And in 2009, Debt per capita hit 100% of income per capita for the first time since the Second World War. Savings? Really? Any extra income we have is going to paying off all the money that we owe. It used to be normal for people who work eight hours to be some of the hardest workers in our society, right? We're talking legal limit for what companies can do, but now the normal workday ends at 9 p.m. if you're lucky. With the advent of greater mobile technology, even when you leave the office, work isn't over. Emails and phone calls keep you in the loop well after hours, and hey, you got that big project coming up, you'd better work on the weekend too and get it all done. It's even worse since the pandemic, the pandemic. The working from home revolution was, in my mind, inevitable, but the lockdowns accelerated it into being. The combination of the home with the office just completely crushed the sacred delineation of the primary two aspects of life, ensuring that while we could turn up to meetings in a house coat, we also had no escape from corporate demands. For those of us lucky enough to have a home office, you could still maintain some physical level of separation, but for many ordinary people, the lack of a space dedicated for work further cements the ties of their job to their home. And you know what happens when people when their work becomes their life, when they are terrified of losing their job, when their job demands all their time, all their thoughts, and when they have no savings and no flexibility, they have no power. If people wanted to protest 50 years ago, they could. Why? Because they had savings put away. They actually owned their home. They owned their car. They didn't have $90,000 in debt like the average American household today. They could take a month off to strike. They could let the corporations or the governments know they're not gonna put up with their behavior. And there's nothing they could do to make them bend their knee because their friends, their family, their community, who they work side by side with and also have the ability to not be worried about starving to death or defaulting on rent for months and months at a time, would be there with them, side by side, not trying to cancel them on Twitter from states and states away. And they could withstand, they could keep up these protests for long enough that corporations and governments would give a damn about what they were upset about. Some of the largest political changes in history have been entirely because of worker union strikes. For many, even if you do decide, screw it to my work, screw it to my mortgage, I'm gonna go to Ottawa with my truck and protest, the government just don't even seem to care about people's basic rights anymore. And unfortunately, I think all of this is by design. No one will stick their neck out because they're all owned. If you have debt, you can't afford to lose your job. If you're living paycheck to paycheck, you can't afford to criticize or protest your company. If you're supporting a family, a mortgage, and a life, you can't afford to go to your town hall at 2 p.m., confront the teacher's board about the garbage being put in your kids' textbooks because you've got meetings until 8 p.m. first thing the next morning. This is an intolerable situation, but far too many in the political class seem far too preoccupied with licking the corporate and government boot to realize this. Yes, 
Of course you should work. But you know what's more important than giving your life to some nameless, faceless corporation owned by Jeff Bezos? Giving your time and efforts to your community, building bridges on hiking paths, doing a food drive for the homeless, picking berries with your kids and making pies with it for community barbecues, fixing your elderly neighbor's fence, volunteering at the old folks' home, all these things that used to be normal before work became our lives. When we think about the Protestant work ethic, that's the work that Christ was talking about. Not making sure you get 7,000 spam email advertisements for some bullshit beauty product out to your Indian customer base you don't even speak the same language as before your 6 p.m. deadline. I don't necessarily purport to have solutions to all of this. This video is more so a wake-up call for a crisis I think conservatives should be addressing more often. Because the left are right when they say that our work culture is toxic and soul-destroying. I'm not saying they have the right answers. Lord knows gulags are far more soul-destroying than a 9 to 5 at Starbucks, although you might get shot at both. But my point is that conservatives need to start taking this seriously. We need to start understanding why younger generations are so apathetic towards work, why they just don't seem to care to have the same drive to contribute to society as those who came before them. We need to start taking the fact that workers are not being treated properly, are not being compensated properly, and their concerns do not make them leftists or communists seriously. We need to listen because these are people's entire lives we're talking about. It's not one little problem. It's not some culture war bullshit. You know, work is where people are spending their entire days, the majority of their waking hours. And if conservatives refuse to acknowledge the torment that has become the average person's work day, then we will never win them over. So I hope to God, we can manage that. And I appreciate you all for watching this video. I'm sure there'll be an interesting comment section. I will see you all there.